Hello, everybody. My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, Dragons and Damsels in the Sky with Dinosaur Hill. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask the audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. We'd also like to thank the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Our next program is a concert featuring the, the Swing Syndicate Big Band, which will be an in-person event on Wednesday, August 23rd at 6 p.m. on the library's West Lawn. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. In the event of rain, it will be moved into this room. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenter, Amanda Felk. The on. There we go. All right. So, uh, my name is Amanda Felk. I am the current program director at Dinosaur Hill Nature Preserve. I've been there about two years now, so I can hardly call myself new anymore, right? Um, I'll still use it as an excuse. I'm, I'm new every day. Um, for any that don't know, Dinosaur Hill is a nature preserve and nature center that is located in the North Hill Circle neighborhood. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can access it through the different neighborhoods, including through the community garden and the new um, Sugar Maple Grove Park. If you haven't been, I was just at the, um, the ribbon cutting for that one. So uh, they're, they're planning on putting a real path in It'll be really exciting. Um, so yeah, nature is my, my jam. Um, a bunch of weird little animal presentations that I like to come to libraries and, and stuff and give. Um, and tonight is about dragonflies and damselflies. All right, They're so pretty. All right, so first we're gonna start out. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies, of course, are in the order, or rather the class of insects. And as an insect, just a reminder, they have three body parts. Anyone know what those three body parts are? Uh, head, thorax, and abdomen. Head, thorax, and abdomen, awesome. All right, what else do they have? What does all insects have? Wings. Wings, yes. So you're gonna say, oh, but there are some insects that don't fly. Sometimes they have vestigial wings. Luckily for Odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies, we don't have to worry about the vestigial wing difference um, right now. All right, what else do they have? Knees. Knees are on there. Legs. On their legs, yes. And they all have six legs that are jointed, so they do have knees, yes, absolutely. Um, so all insects have six jointed legs, they have those three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, they have antennae, they have wings, they have breathing tubes, um, and they have a mouth, uh -uh. and they have eyes, right? So these are some of the important parts that we'll be going over for these guys. In particular, Odonata is the class where we find our D&D, &D. Uh, not the game, sorry. It's the easiest way to abbreviate it if I'm not using Odonata, right? Um, so it still has dragons in it, just not dungeons, damsels instead. Um, so our earliest fossils for Odonata are found in the Triassic period, you know, about 200 million years ago. So they've got a little bit of history. And then before that, we have some early Carboniferous uh, period ancestors called the griffin flies, which, wow, it would be awesome to see one of those. They could be up to 30 feet. Um, sorry, I put a, the wrong uh, number in there. They could be 30 feet wide, wingspan. All right, uh, so the griffin flies were really giant and they came before the dragonflies and the damselflies, and other insects came from them as well. So here I have a replica fossil. If you'd like to pass this to your neighbor until it makes it across the room. Uh, this one is from a dragonfly 
right at that 200 million year ago mark. All right. Um, so our D and Ds, uh, let's do their stats, right? Uh, so their eggs are laid either in or above the water uh, on a plant above the water. Every life stage, once they come out of the egg, uh, is carnivorous, particularly insectivorous, right? So that means that as soon as they had from their egg, they are eating little creatures in the water. And those little creatures are other insects, usually other insect larvae. So it's like baby insects chasing baby insects. Um, but the ones that they are eating, we're not going to feel sorry for these baby insects because those are mosquito larvae. Right? <laughs> A lot of mosquito larvae, some other things. Uh, but yes, definitely some mosquito larvae. This order of Odonata, back in the Triassic period and before their relatives, those griffin flies, they were the first in flight. So that means that they were the first insects that had ever flown. It's pretty mind blowing, right? Um, so right now in the world, that's just a little ancient history, um, but right now there are around 6,400 living species worldwide that have been identified. Um, as we test more, we learn more. And here in Michigan alone, there's about 170 species. So the rest of this program will just be me listing them with their scientific names for you. <laughs> Are you sorry you signed up? You locked the door, right? <laughs> no. Okay. So no, I, uh, I will not go over all 170 uh, of these animals for you today. Uh, instead, I'm going to pick and choose. All right. Uh, there are different families within this order of Odonata, and so they make up right now. Again, they're doing DNA testing. It's become more accessible to, to get that kind of thing done and to figure out, are these two specimens the same species or not? Are they just closely related? Are these actually related or not? Are these in the same family? Um, so uh, now we're saying about 11 families of dragonfly, which is usually, as a layperson, what you would want to identify it to, right? So you're going to identify it to family and around 27 or so damselfly families, because the families are the ones that are going to have characteristics that are pretty similar to one another. Uh, another part of being an insect, excellent, is that you change. You undergo something. It's a big long word that starts with an M. Anyone know what it is? Meta. Morphosis. Yes, to change form from one form to another. So in dragonflies and damselflies, they start as. Eggs, big shocker, right? Little tiny eggs. We can pass that one around too. Thank you. Have a chance to look at those. And then, in particular, this one is a dragonfly. And we'll go over why this is a dragonfly, not a damselfly, in the next slide. But then they grow from that little egg, they hatch into this thing. Would you look at this and think that this? Is a dragonfly? Just no, by looking no, at it? No. So that is what we call our first instar nymph. Right? So different dragonfly and damselfly species, they will have a different amount of instars. Usually it is somewhere uh, between four to seven. Um, different times that they will change throughout their lives. So this is our second instar. Now this one looks a little bit more like that one, uh, but just a little bit bigger, right? And then for this particular species, then we end up with the adult. And there might be another adult one after this. Right? And so, okay, wow. this is so here we have, I can use the pointer part at least. Whoosh. All right, so here we have those nymphs, right, for this dragonfly. It might start here, 
and then go to here, and then get really big and long, and then it comes out. So every time it grows, it is an insect. It is undergoing metamorphosis. That means that it has to shed its exoskeleton. Can you imagine if you shed your skeleton and you grew? Wow. All right. So then they will climb outside of their skeleton. It's very spooky. And they will look like this, much like a butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. They'll let their wings flap and dry out just a little bit before they fly off. And that means that as a dragonfly and damselfly aficionado, when you're going out and you're identifying these guys, that means you have something to look for. So they leave behind these husks. Um, I don't have one of them with me today. They don't hold up too well to travel. Um, but if you go and you look in reeds and cattails, you might find a little exoskeleton that we call the effuvia. It's a fun word to say. You want to say it with me? Effuvia. And there are actually scientists, there's citizen science projects out there where you can collect the effuvia and send them to scientists who know what species they are just from their shed exoskeleton. And they can find out a lot about different habitat quality um, based on that. All right. So then up here, we've got some other little nymphs. Do you see anything different about from these guys compared to these ones? Why do you say that? What's different? They look so much different. Because they look different? What do you see that's different? They have something like at the end that's like three points. Yes, yeah. So they have these three points at the end, absolutely. All right. Right. So there are two main things that every animal out in the wild likes to do. One of them is eat, right, and get their energy up. And the next one is to make more of their kind. And so for dragonflies, I think this is a little funny. For dragonflies, what that means is that the males are always looking to make more of their kind. They hang out along the stream beds and they just kind of wait there until there are girls that are looking to help them make more of their kind. And then they put on really cool dances, right? They do a little sock hop, maybe one of those swing dances like's coming up, right? Uh, over here at the library. And the females, they eat. They go out to the meadows and they eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And God, once, they're, once they're adults and they're thinking about eating, they're flying in the air. What could they possibly be eating? What are they eating out in the air? They're a flying insect. Mosquitoes! Yes, they can eat the adult mosquitoes, not that they're adults, right? And so the girls are out there and they're getting all of this energy out in the meadows. And so sometimes after they're ready, right, once they said, oh, I've eaten enough, I couldn't possibly eat anymore, I'm in a food coma, I guess I'll go hang out with the boys. And so they go over to the stream edges and you'll see them uh, doing these weird shapes. And that is because the way to make little dragonflies is to exchange genetic material. And just like you may have heard about sharks, they have special organs called claspers. And what they do is they grab on to the female's head. It's weird, right? So, so sometimes you can even see them. They almost start to make this kind of heart shape. Totally a human thing, though. Yes? We'll see. Ta -da -da. 
All right, so here is where we're going to start talking about eyes. Right? So we have dragonflies and damselflies. What's the difference? We'll see here that dragonflies have the two compound eyes and they actually meet in the middle of their forehead. So they don't have a room for a simple eye. And dragonflies have these compound eyes. And what a compound eye means is that unlike our eye, where we're looking, we see everything all at once, right? We have one lens. This takes in the whole room, each eye, right? Or half, half, or they divvy it up, right? A compound eye would be like if this were the surface of your eye, and each one of these little squares was another lens. So each piece of your eye is taking in just a piece of what's in front of you. And your brain is sifting through that and putting thousands, some dragonflies up to 4,000 little lenses, 4,000 pieces of the puzzle, all together every second, multiple times per second. So if you look through this little screen, you can pass that around. It's almost like what it would be like to look through a dragonfly. Sometimes we look at, um, you'll go places and people will tell you, oh, this is what an insect sees like, and they give you that little kaleidoscope thing that has all the little bubbles. But that's just showing you multiple versions of the whole picture, right? So the dragonfly's brain is actually doing a lot of work because it's putting all 4,000 pieces together in that puzzle. I don't know about you guys, but I, it takes me a long time to put a 4,000 piece puzzle together. Usually some help too, right? So they have compound eyes. The damselflies also have compound eyes, but they've got a space in between them, right? So that's one of the ways that we can tell them apart if we're looking, is that if we look at their eyes and there's a space, it's a damselfly. Another way that we look, oh, look. What's that again? It's a nymph. And this one is a dragonfly. It just has this kind of pointy rear end. And the damselfly nymph has that three-pronged tail. Uh, there are some other water larvae, the mayfly larvae, that have three tails as well. Um, you'll know them because they have gills, but the dragonflies don't or damselflies, sorry. All right, the other thing, the big one that most people will tell me is the dragonflies at rest, they droop their wings. They are completely flat out, right? And no, this is a rubber one. Uh, I couldn't keep it still, right? If it was a, a real one. So the damselflies will fold their wings up together, and it almost looks like they only have one wing, doesn't it? But you can see all four wings of the dragonfly. So the damselfly does have two sets. They're just tapered more and really close together. Right? Um, so the dragonfly, some other differences, they do tend to be larger. Dragonflies can be about two, two and a half inches. It's pretty sizable when you think about this guy who can be sometimes I thought I had a small one in the front. Um, sometimes as small as an inch or so. Right. So they tend to be larger. The dragonflies tend to see a little bit better. They have more of those lenses per compound eye. They can both see in UV light spectrum, so they can see more colors than we do. So if we think they look pretty the way they look to us, imagine if you could see the UV spectrum too. They could have like polka dots and stripes, zigzags, all kinds of cool patterns. The other thing that uh, they do is the dragonflies are higher flyers. Um, because they are larger, they're a little bit safer if they go up high. And the damselflies, because they're smaller, and also, thank you. is this bug real? It is real. It's not alive anymore. Yep. All right. So they're also lower flyers because they're small. They stay in the vegetation so they can hide so things don't eat them. 
right? Because no matter where you are, the, the whole food chain is something's above you, something's below you, right? All right. So the dragonflies can actually fly up, down, side, side, front, back, right? So they're, they're kind of like hel what helicopters are designed on. They can lift in four different ways. Um, so they can, they can fly in rainy days, which is something that not a lot of flighted insects can do uh, because their wings are not quite the same as something like a butterfly that has uh, scales on it that need to be protected. They can also fly faster. Uh, so some dragonflies have been found to fly up to 10 miles per hour. That's pretty fast for something that's this big. <laughs> yeah. So some of our most common Michigan dragonflies, I'm just going to go with like two and three of our D&Ds here. Um, so for dragonflies, these are the ones that you're, you've probably seen before a thousand times. Um, this one here is the eastern pond hawk on my friend Griffin's hand. Um, you'll find all of these usually around wetlands. Gosh, where would you find a wetland in Michigan? I don't know. Uh, but the eastern pond hawk is going to be one of the larger ones. Um, these are all three actually kind of the bigger guys. Um, they eat a lot of mosquitoes. They'll also eat other dragonflies or damselflies sometimes too. Um, any kind of insect that they can find. How about this one, the common white tail skimmer. Anyone see one of these before? I think. Yeah. So these ones, um, you can tell the males will have a very powdery blue tail and this black, black and white striping or banding on the wings. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's a nice easy way to tell this one apart. The pond hawk I'll tell you is one that you'll commonly see, and I will tell you that every time I see it, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. What is that? And then I look it up, and I'm like, oh, it's a pound hawk again. <laughs> <laughs> and then this guy, this one is probably our most famous dragonfly in Michigan because this one has been in the running three times to be Michigan's state insect. Sometimes it has run unopposed and still not made it. Sometimes it has run against the monarch butterfly and not made it. And to this day, as of January, there's still not a Michigan State insect. So um, you can put your votes in now. Let's try Green Darner 2024, right? There is, there is, there is, there is no insect. <laughs> there is no state insect. People keep saying, we want this insect. And they're like, nah. No state insect. <laughs> Give me a button. I expect it to. <laughs> and then these guys. Oh, gosh. These ones are awesome. Did I say that already? <laughs> uh, these ones are some pretty cool ones that I was really excited to see here in Michigan. I think they're really um, just really super fun ones to find. They're not as common. Yes, sir. Almost, yeah. Do you see why? Why would you think they might call it a Halloween pennant? Because those are the colors of, ha of Halloween. Oh, that's a good idea. All right, that's you should be in charge of naming dragonflies. Okay, so the the, bl the black stands for bats, probably, and the orange probably stands for jack o' <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. That's a good question. All right, so here we have the red saddlebags. Um, here in Michigan, we have the red saddlebags and we have the black saddlebags. I didn't put pictures of both because you've seen one, you can kind of guess what the other one looks like, right? Um, this one is a great example of the fact that nature is everywhere. The time that I've seen this dragonfly here in Michigan, it was over by my house around this time of year my house is at 13 Mile in Woodward, not Woodward in Rochester, Woodward in Royal Oak. Uh, 
And in August, there's this thing that happens in the weekend, and there's a few million people and cars all around. So it makes it hard to drive places uh, leading up to that event, the Woodward Dream Cruise. And so I was walking down Woodward Avenue to the sushi place to meet a friend, and I saw black saddlebags dragonfly on Woodward Avenue during Dream Cruise Week. So tell me that's not a really a, a very natural environment, right? <laughs> Where you'd expect to find some, some wildlife. Um, so I was super excited about it. Really glad I wasn't in a car because I would have been in an accident. <laughs> and, uh, and every time I drive down Woodward now, I'm still kind of keeping an eye out, <laughs> hoping to see one again. The Halloween pennant. This, when I first started diving into dragonflies and damselflies, this was my mecca. This was the dragonfly that I was searching for. Because I am a fan of Halloween and all things spooky. Um, especially Dinosaur Hills, Halloween Hoot, little plug there. Uh, but here we've got a dragonfly that is orange and black. And he's, uh, he's just an amazing little guy. And so I finally saw him in about, gosh, I think it might have been the beginning of October. So I was getting really anxious because I started looking for dragonflies in around May, right? This was like I got in just in the time, just in time for dragonfly season. I was going to find every dragonfly I could, all 170 Michigan species. OK, that, that was my goal, right? Um, just like Pokemon, you got to find them all. But, <laughs> so I was looking and looking and looking, and then I was out at um, Oakland County's Orion Park, uh, the dog park, actually, near the dumpster. I'd gotten a little backwards on the trails, and <laughs> it's my first time there. And I was by the dumpsters, and guess who I found? A Halloween pennant. So exciting. Um, this is not. Uh, this one. This one is not either. Um, so I usually use on splash, and my last slide shows the uh, the people that took the pictures. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. So I can get some license free photos. Um, the autumn pond hawk here is my photo. Yay! I actually remember to take a picture. These guys are so fast. Remember, up to 10 miles per hour, there's no way I'm catching that. Um, by the time I'm like, camera, they're like, bye. Yeah. So the autumn pond hawk, it has another name. And this is an easy one to identify. So these ones are some of the, like, the flashier dragonflies here in Michigan. And they're also some of the most easy to identify. We can tell if they have this little splotch of color right around their waist. They're saddlebags, right? If it's black, then they're black saddlebags. If it's red, then they're red saddlebags. Halloween pennant, you can't miss that one. This one, oh gosh, there's a lot of brown dragonflies, aren't there? How could you possibly be able to tell this one without a microscope? Let me guess, you see it in autumn. You do see it in autumn. But in other ways, it has these yellow legs. Another name for them is the yellow-legged pond hawk. So, there are a lot of little nitpicky details when, we f when we're looking for different species. Some of the ones that we're looking at um, is the legs. So in this case, leg color is a lot easier to tell apart one from another just from a picture, right, um, than something else might be. Yeah, look at these wings. Just amazing. All right. Yeah. So then, we have damselflies, which are even smaller. And they're more skittish because they're smaller, right? And they're always going to try to find cover, except these guys. <laughs> so these are the ones that you'll probably see very often. Um, Usually the end of July or so, if you walk along any creek in Michigan, you will see one of these at least. 
possibly two, possibly 100, something like that. Some, somewhere in between, right? So these ones, there's an also a neat trick. You can tell the boys from the girls, not just because you're looking at who's eating or if they happen to be in a meadow, but because the girls will have a white patch right here. And it looks like someone just took their thumb in white paint and went, So the girls uh, will have the white patch and the boys don't. They all have these really beautiful iridescent bodies that look like jewels. That's where they get the name. That's why it's called the Bonnie Jewel. Yeah. And then here we have, oh boy. <laughs> We're going to go into families again for damselflies especially. Um, I personally am not a fan of stressing out insects. I mean, a lot of people think they're just insects, but uh, I'm not really into stressing any animal out and taking them away from you know, collecting that food or continuing the species, as it were. Um, so I will very rarely, <laughs> um, very rarely do anything more invasive than a, a, a photograph. And these bluets are so tiny. Their body here, this abdomen, is thin. yes. It's about as thin as maybe I don't know, a spaghetti noodle, right? And so, some of the ways we can tell them apart are by slight variations in coloring. Um, sometimes on their thorax, where all their legs attach. Sometimes on parts of their abdomen. And sometimes there's parts of their head that are very small that you need a microscope, not just binoculars, not just a magnifying glass, but an actual microscope um, to tell the difference. So I am very happy to say it's a bluet. It could be a stream bluet. It could be a pond bluet. It could be a river bluet. But the main thing is the, the whole family is the bluets, right? And another. Um, I forgot when we got to the legs here. What we, when we look at these legs, these, well, the other ones are on the back side there, see? So like this one's a front leg, and then back here is the back, the side, the other side. Yeah. When we look at these legs, they're not made for walking. Why would you walk if you can fly? Dragonfly legs are made for grasping, and so that makes them ferocious predators that are able to grab their food in midair. They can grab that mosquito. They can hover too. I don't know if I mentioned that when we said in flying. They can hover in space. Um, and so it's a great, a great, great uh, thing to have, right? Those legs for grasping. But if they tried to stand, they just fall. Are you saying that damselflies don't uh, grasp? No, oh, no, the damselflies too. I'm sorry. It was, it was both dragons, both D and Ds. Yeah. And then our notable Michigan damselflies, which I have seen some, um, but I have not seen this one yet. I'm always going to say yet. The American ruby spot damselfly here, still not a very large one. This is a great picture. Um, but we just have this one little red spot. Makes it pretty cool, right? It'd be a great one to see. Yeah. And then, once again, we have a family. Uh, and these are the ones I've seen occasionally. These are the ones that break the rule. How do damselflies hold their wings when they're at rest? Together. What do you, wait a minute. Spread wings. Yeah, these ones, their wings when they're flying, when they're at rest, they still leave them spread out, but they are still damselflies. If we look, we can see the space here in between their eyes, and they definitely have the same body type. And if we saw them as a nymph, how would their rear end look? Three prongs. Three prongs. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen a three, um, I've seen a few three prong forks. Excellent. Oh. 
So this one, this is just me being proud. Oh, going too far. In my slideshow. There should be a plate. Yeah, there we go. It's just proud that I got it, that shot. <laughs> my five seconds of dragonfly video. <laughs> So then, I know, I went through that pretty fast there, but I do have more to show you uh, and to talk about, but I want your help to talk about those things. I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I enjoy talking about these kinds of things, um, and I also want to uh, take any questions that you have, and I want to make sure you know about these resources. So uh, the Dragonfly Society of the Americas is an organization that I just joined. Um, I found out about it when I was traveling at Mothapalooza, going to learn about other insects. <laughs> and I ran into some dragonfly folks. Um, I really went to Mothapalooza in order to go on a dragonfly field trip. I <laughs> so uh, it's only 15 bucks, I think, for a year for a membership. And their next, uh, their next meeting is actually supposed to be in Ohio next year. So I'll definitely be keeping my, my eye on the calendar for that one. Um, a really good website that I use for insect identification, if I'm looking for an animal specific to Michigan, is insectidentification.org. Um, and you can search that, any kind of insect. You can search it by state. You can search their caterpillar thing. is. A, a search is amazing. You can search based on, you know, if it has a horn, if it's hairy, if it's color, striped, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, so you can fall into that rabbit hole and be there for days <laughs> looking at insects. Because, I mean, who wouldn't? And then um, I did bring my copy. Wouldn't be a library program without a book, right? Uh, this is my copy of the Beginner's Guide to Dragonflies, uh, put out by Stokes. It's a nice picture, picture book that tells you a little bit more about the dragonflies. And in here, unfortunately, the entire internet was not able to provide me with a picture of this particular dragonfly, which is a pretty massive one that we can find here in Michigan. It is called the Dragon Hunter. What do you think it might eat? It has these spread out wings, right? Yes, yeah, this one's a dragonfly. Yeah, I think it might eat other dragonflies. It eats other dragonflies, yes. So he's a pretty massive guy. Nice tiger stripes. Wow. And if you found his, um, his nymph is about a, as big around as a quarter, uh, very flat. So they're not just fun to see when they're flying around, and it's not just fun to collect their effluvia off of the, the plant life, um, but you can also go looking for nymphs if you go dip netting in creeks and rivers, and you can see if you can find them. You can do that as citizen science projects too. I know the Clinton River Watershed Council does some stream monitoring with benthic monitoring. Um, other area watershed councils. Pardon me? Yeah. What is the lifespan? Uh, the lifespan, the whole lifespan, it varies a lot by species. Uh, it can be up to five years. Uh, but some of that is because they're overwintering um, in their nymph form under the ice, under the water, uh, and they're kind of dormant then for periods. Um. So if you do go into the streams to get some of these, you want to be sure and put them back, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, I mean, it, unless you want the baby mosquitoes to grow <laughs> up. <laughs> Are uh, DVDs attracted to any specific plants, like monarchs? Oh, so they're completely insectivorous. They are an indication that um, that there's good biodiversity if there's a lot of different species of them, um, but they don't they don't need the plant for um, for their babies to eat. 
right? Um, so they don't really care. As long, it's basically whatever is above the water where kids to land in. They want to make sure their kids go into a good school system. <laughs> it's location, location, location. You know, the, just having a little water nearby. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, if you can attract other insects to your yard, that's great. So try not to use pesticides, of course, because that will kill the dragonfly or its food, and that'll kill the dragonfly. Um, you know, having some native plants around so that you end up with not just pollinators, but other insects will visit those plants as well. Um, and then that'll be food for the dragonfly. Right, so uh, your, your dragonfly feeder is basically build it and they will come. <laughs> yeah, you, you get the other bugs that you don't necessarily want and then they come and they take care of those for you and you're like, thank you dragonfly and damselfly. <laughs> yes? Oh yes, they're, they, are, they are very territorial, um, particularly the males. Um, mostly because they're looking for those girls. But sometimes you can find them traveling in the same circuit in an area or in the yard or something. Yeah. Continue to go around looking, checking to see if the girls are there or if the guys Yeah. Are or the tasty mosquitoes are ready. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, if you spray the mosquitoes, you're not going to get ready. That's right. And where do they go in the winter, the grown ones? Uh, the grown ones will usually pass away in the winter time here. Yeah, it's usually the end of their life cycle. They've already laid their eggs. Their babies are already passing it. They'll, their baby, their eggs will either overwinter as eggs or they'll overwinter as nymphs. And the whole cycle starts all over again. Oh, well, because most of it's underwater, right? Um, so there are species, you know, south of us there are species that live longer as adults. Um, so I was going worldwide, they can have up to a five year lifespan, but they can spend up to two years as nymphs. Yeah. Uh, well, we do stream dipping field trips. Uh, we also partake in offering stream dipping on um, the Clinton River Watershed's um, River Day event. We offer free stream dipping for anyone who comes by. Uh, that's in the first weekend of June. Yeah. So we do, we do some stream dipping. We've done some. Uh, we had bug camp this week. We took out to, to stream dip. So we, uh, we definitely do some. Uh, we also had someone from the Clinton River Watershed Council that was um, checking, I think. But uh, they did that on their own. Um, they didn't necessarily tell us when they were coming. <laughs> and we also have one of the middle school's um, science teachers comes uh, with a class every May as well, and they come out and do some stream dipping. It's usually fun because we have like the middle schoolers doing their thing out on the creek, and then we go by with a group of kindergartners. <laughs> They're like, oh, big kids. <laughs> Any other questions? Damselflies and dragonflies. Yes. So I want to know a little more about insect identification. Yeah, so uh, that website, insectidentification.org, you can look up um, just about any insect and you can search them. So if you know it's a beetle, right? And then you can search the beetles and then be like, in the state of Michigan. And then it'll give you other choices. And you can like filter it out by color, um, by antenna shape, all kinds of different ways. Yeah. I thought it was like some sort of um, website that you could put in your camera and then it would identify for you. <laughs> yeah, well, you do have um, apps like Seek and iNaturalist where you can do that kind of thing. But those always have to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, I've had experiences. Uh, you can't really be sure that that's exactly what that species is. Sometimes seek will show me plants that are native to Australia, 
because they have a similar leaf shape. And I use it more like if I know, Seek is a lot better for plants than anything else. And I usually use it to verify what I think it is. Like, oh, is this actually false Solomon seal? Oh, Seek agrees with me. Chances are it is. <laughs> um, in fact, it identified a moth that I saw as one that was like from Brazil, uh, which is very, un very unlikely to have been here. Yeah. So I do um, also have, if you would like to look for, through them or look at them, we do have some specimens here um, of different dragon and damselflies. I think this one is one of the spread wings. The, the issue with these specimens is that these were part of a scientific collection, and so they have scientific names, but not common names. <laughs> uh, but you can see these are um, a collection that was donated to us, um, and they are preserved specimens. Um, to preserve a dragonfly or a damselfly, you would insert a pin and let the fluids leak out of it, um, and then you can either pin it uh, with its wings spread in what we call a Riker mount, or you can put it in a glassine envelope, kind of like a fancy comic book, right? Um, and you can see that these specimens, I think the oldest one in this box is from 1995, so they hold up fairly well uh, as long as they're in a protected enclosure. This is obviously not something that I personally would do, <laughs> especially if you want them out there catching them, um, the bugs. Uh, but if you happen to find one that's already passed, like I said, the adults in the wintertime, um, might, you might find a deceased one somewhere and you wanted to save it, something you could do. If you want to come up and you want to look through the box and see if you find anything else cool you want to see, feel free to rifle through, <laughs> through my specimens. Thanks for coming. Uh, these are also just my photo credits, so some of the photos are mine, and like I said, I get most of my um, license-free photos from onsplash.com or from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Digital Library, um, which is pretty cool, except this time my computer didn't want to load onto it, said it had a certificate, security certificate issue. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.